Hey guys, an ancient secret lies hidden in these female carvings of Rani Kivav Temple. These women, known as Madanikas, are carved in most Indian temples, but in this temple, they reveal a shocking secret. Here's a woman just waking up from her sleep. See how she's stretching her arms as we all do as soon as we wake up. Notice her hair, how it is made into a casual bun from last night. What would she do next? Of course, she has to go take a bath and get ready for the day. She has now taken a bath and is standing in front of a mirror. Look at her hair now. It is not in a bun. She has long, wet hair. And she's wrapping a towel around her hair and drying it. This is called a towel wrap. And most women do it today before they use a hair dryer. The sculptor has beautifully captured this moment where she's casually drying off her hair. But there is a twist in the carving. You see this bird? What is it doing here? The water droplets from the tip of her hair is trickling drop by drop, and the bird is fascinated by this, and it is drinking those water droplets. Now, look at this figure. This is carved in the restricted area of the temple, so I could not get a close-up view of the carving. But she is doing something strange. She is holding a weird device. Can you tell me what it is? Yes, it is a hair dryer. I know some of you will say this is a ridiculous claim. They did not use hair dryers a thousand years ago. But what if I told you Indians still use these ancient hair dryers, but they're not electric hair dryers. In India, most women still do not use electric hair dryers. They burn a natural benzoin resin called sambrani. They will put it inside a container and light it on fire and close the lid, which has holes on it. The device has a long handle and benzoin burns slowly and the women let their hair dry from the heat and smoke. We can buy these native hair dryers in any country store in India. Okay, what happens next? Of course, she would put on makeup and lipstick, right? And you may think that Indian women did not use lipstick in ancient times, but you are wrong. Again and again, I've shown you ancient carvings where lipstick was used by women. This is a thousand-year-old temple, and you can clearly see that she is putting lipstick on. This is why I keep saying that we should recognize Rani Kivav as a wonder of the world because it changes history. Many people think lipsticks were invented in Europe. No, Indians were using lipstick more than 2,000 years ago. In my previous videos, when I mentioned that ancient Indians used lipstick, many historians tried to dismiss it, saying, no, she's chewing beetle leaves, or she's about to eat a piece of clove, etc., simply because it goes against the mainstream narrative. But the ancient text of Kama Sutra clearly mentions that women used lipstick to appear beautiful. The book even tells us how they made lipstick. It was made of beeswax and coloring agents. And this book is around 1,800 years old. So you can imagine how Indian women were pioneers in fashion technology. And here's another one, a woman putting eyeliner. She's looking at the mirror and she's putting on eyeliner, or I don't know if it's mascara or whatever you call it. And you may have previously thought that eyeliners and mascaras and all these fashion accessories were creations from the Western world. 
But look, I'm showing you a series of ancient carvings proving that Indian women were doing all of this. Women of India probably lived the same lifestyle just like today's women if they were not more advanced. Now, women naturally like to look good, but what else do they want? They also want to smell good, so they put on body spray or deodorant. And that's exactly what we see here. This is the ancient Indian deodorant, and it is 100% natural. She's holding a piece of sandal wood in one hand. In the other hand, she's holding a small stone made wet with water. And she's rubbing the sandal wood, and you start to see the wood slowly become sandal paste, and then she will smear it all over her body, and it will smell like heaven. How do I know this? Because this practice still exists today in many parts of India. But this is so backward, right? Why don't they use body sprays? Well, 50 years from now, experts will claim that these sprays give you cancer and will recommend that you go back to natural sandal paste if they haven't already started doing that. Plus, sandal paste is a very good moisturizer. It is perfect for fixing dry skin. So all this latest cosmetic stuff you see, like moisturizing cream deodorant from Dove, they were already using the same stuff in India more than 1,000 years ago. Here, you can see a woman putting red powder on her forehead called Sindur. It is powdered vermilion. Even today, married Hindu women put it on their forehead to appreciate the love of their husbands. Some now claim that this is pure patriarchy. Why does a woman have to appreciate her husband? And so on. But these ancient practices are based on common sense, just like how married people in the West are wearing wedding rings. In real life, before you approach a man or a woman, you check their fingers to see if they're married or not. And this sindhu is the equivalent of the wedding ring. And what about Indian men, right? Originally, men had to wear a toe ring when they got married, and women could look at his toe and say, oh, he's a married man, and then walk away. But these practices are slowly becoming extinct because we are not researching and documenting the common sense ideas behind ancient practices. I'm not going to show you how many Madanikas are putting on a variety of ornaments, okay? They're shown wearing earrings, they're shown donning anklets, and so on and so forth. The amount of jewelry they wore in ancient times is insane. When we recreate this visually, it is shocking to see how much gold was used by ancient Indian women. And believe it or not, Indian women alone still hold more than 10% of the world's entire gold. But everything you've seen so far was just about the body. I mean, without the mind and emotions, we would all just be lumps of flesh, right? Here, we can see a mother. Look at the bond between the mom and the child. If we look carefully, we can see the innocence in the baby's face. The baby seems to be agitated. It's about to cry for some reason. Look at the hand of the mother. She's pointing to something up top, like the moon, and telling the baby a random story to pacify the baby. Lots of carvings show women working as musicians and dancers. Here, you can see this woman holding a cylindrical object in her hands. What is that? Let me recreate that using Photoshop. You see that this is a flute. Yeah, she's playing a flute. But look at her standing position. She's twisting her hip and showing her beauty while playing the flute. 
and also look at her feet. Her toes are not even touching the ground. This must be a native art form where they're playing flute and dancing simultaneously. And here's a carving where this woman is holding a pot in a strange angle. What is going on here? Apparently, a traveler who was walking by has knocked on her door and asked for water because he's thirsty. Look how this man is keeping his hands like a cup. But she's not going to pour water. She's going to pour milk or buttermilk from her pot. But why is she giving him milk or buttermilk instead of water? Many texts mention that ancient India was so rich that travelers did not take any food or water with them. They would just knock on any door and they would be fed with tasty food and exotic drinks. In fact, the people were so rich that giving mere water to travelers was considered an insult. Helping strangers is a key factor in human evolution. We rarely see this behavior in other animals. But here we can see this animal, a monkey playing with this madaniga. It's pulling down her robe in a playful manner, revealing her body. The woman is trying to shoo away the monkey with a stick or with her bare hand. There are multiple carvings of this theme with slight variations. What about this one? With her left hand, she is showing a weird hand signal with two fingers sticking out. With her right hand, she is holding something that looks like a bowl. What is going on here? Do you see this at the bottom? Behind her legs, we can see, yes, it is a dog and you can even see one of its eyes and the mouth and the wagging tail. She's feeding her pet dog and she's giving it a hand signal, probably to wait, rather than giving a voice command. Dog trainers sometimes train dogs with hand signals today, but we can see that this was an ancient Indian practice as well. Dogs and monkeys as pets, that's nothing, right? It's time to see some exotic pets. Here's a beautiful Madanika, but look on top of her. What are these? Are they aliens? No, they're baby owls. Baby owls actually look like gray aliens. Recently, some people even found these baby owls in an abandoned house and thought they were aliens. But this woman has these owls as pets. This is really crazy because these carvings give us a window to look into the ancient world. Who would have imagined that ancient Indians had owls as pets? But it gets better. Look at her hand. Again, you can see the two fingers. But look at the other hand. She's holding an oval bowl. But look right next to it. You can see a snake, a cobra with its open hood. Is the snake's mouth touching the bowl? I think she's extracting the venom of the cobra into the bowl. I know that the practice of venom extraction from snakes has existed for centuries in India, but here we are seeing that the cobra is not pressured by the woman. It almost appears to voluntarily release its venom into the bowl. And perhaps the hand signal is making the cobra do it. And below, you can see another bird. It's not an owl, it is a peacock. You can identify it by its long tail feathers. Imagine the lifestyle of this Madanika. This is really fantastic. Who has owls, peacocks, and snakes as pets today, right? Strange, twisted, coiled snakes appear here and there. And this temple has many carvings of women with snakes. Look at this. This woman is almost going to smack a cobra. Look at her hand with a flat palm. She's going to slap it gently. 
to teach a lesson or something like that. Again, here's another one with some variation. She's showing a hand signal to the snake and the snake seems to be looking at it, but her other hand is ready to gently punish the snake. This kind of a woman was called Nagakanya in ancient Sanskrit, meaning snake woman. But why did women have them as pets? Here you can see this woman, but where's the snake? There's no snake and she looks quite seductive. She's opening the robes by herself. But be careful, there is a scorpion hiding in her clothes. Was she an ancient honey trap? This is really interesting, right? This type of Madanika is called a Vishakanya, meaning a venomous virgin. Again, I will show you more venomous virgins in this temple. Some say they were ancient Indian honey traps. These are all shot from a distance, guys, because we cannot access this area. I was zooming in with my DSLR and this is the best I could get. But still, you can see it is the same idea. The women look seductive. They're removing their clothes, but inside the clothes, there is a scorpion hiding. This one is a huge scorpion, by the way. It can cause instant death, I think. Some historians say that these Vishakanyas acted as spies or secret agents and they would lure their enemies with their beauty. But once the enemy touched them, the hidden scorpion would do its thing and kill them. Now, we have looked at various aspects of the body and various aspects of the mind. But why are all these women carved in a temple? What's the point? The word Madanika means something that distracts you, someone who lures you by charm or beauty. Were you distracted by their beauty or did you see the hidden detail? Did you find yourself there by any chance? Did you fall into the trap and were completely entranced by the Madanikas? Or did you see your own soul lurking in the shadows? Everywhere you see a Madanika, you will also see a man that represents you. He's always shown hiding because of his secret dark desires. And he's always shown sideways and directly looking at a Madanika. Look at the eyes of these men. They're always fixated on the Madanikas. Maybe you think these are just desires of hormones and they only apply to young people and they will go away when you become older. This thought of yours doesn't reveal anything about hormones. It only reveals the fact that you are not older yet. You can catch plenty of older men as well doing the same thing. Look around every Madanika, you can see a man hiding, wasting away his life, watching her. This temple was not built for the Madanikas. It was built for you to convey a message to you who's always distracted by Madanikas. Who are your Madanikas? Are they Instagram models? Are they your classmates or colleagues? Who are you thinking about and wasting your time? Not all men are hiding though. Look carefully at the carvings and see how you may have completely missed them. What is going on here? The woman is holding this man by his beard and is just about to slap him. Very interesting. Look at his hand, how he has clasped his hand around her knee, helplessly seeking her support. Is there a difference between this helpless man and this helpless boy? Will he survive without her? Not him, this simp. 
Will he amount to anything without the approval of a Madanika? The more you observe, the more it gets mysterious. He's not a helpless baby. He's actually a warrior, right? Look at the knife on his waist. But has he won his internal battles? Have you ever been desperately in love with someone who has hurt you and rejected you? And instead of walking away, have you ever tried desperately to cajole her, to please her? Have you ever humiliated yourself and tried desperately using lame tactics? I think it's obvious that this man has been friend-zoned by her, but he's still in love with her. But if someone gets rejected enough, they can become a monster. Now the man is shown cutting the woman's leg with a knife. He's trying to intimidate her and get what he wants. Look at the woman's posture. She is absolutely not interested in the man. But there are dark souls amongst us who think they can force themselves on whoever they want. The woman who has just woken up has become his object of desire, and he's willing to do anything to get her. He can even resort to physical violence. Of course, I'm telling you the story from a man's perspective because I am a man. What if you're watching this and you're a woman? If you're a female, are you always dreaming of some guy? And do you think only a boy or a man could make your life complete? Are you waiting for that white knight in shining armor who's going to make you happy for the rest of your life? But what is wrong with that, right? A man seeking a woman and a woman looking for a man's attention? That is life, isn't it? Here, we have to talk about the Eastern philosophy against the Western philosophy. Today, most people do not know anything about Eastern philosophy, especially ancient Indian philosophy. Today, we are completely immersed in Western philosophy. We seek greatness from our society and its approval. The West only cares about the outside. Are people respecting you? Does your family and friends think well of you? Do you have a good-looking partner? Are you getting more likes and followers on social media? Are you making a lot of money? Do you have a nice car and a big house? Do all these things make a man a complete, fulfilled person? If so, why do so many successful people commit suicides? Why are so many celebrities addicted to drugs and alcohol? What good is the society's approval if you're drowning and dying inside? The Eastern philosophy is the complete opposite. Your joy, your happiness does not come from others. It comes from you. The joy lies within yourself. The others do not matter. A husband or a wife or a relationship will not give you permanent happiness. Materials mean nothing. In the East, the greatest people are people who threw away all the materials. Men who threw away their kingdoms, who walked away from their families and friends and sought enlightenment. Sometimes they had to kill their own brothers for righteousness. Sometimes they renounced everything and meditated for decades. They're the ones who are worshipped as gods in India. In Raniki Vav Temple, the difference between humans and gods is clearly established. The humans are shown obsessed with another human or obsessed with themselves. But the gods, look at how they're shown. They always look straight, neither obsessed with others or with themselves. 
They're not distracted by these petty things, and they're shown in an eternal state of peace. Yet, those gods were once mere humans who had their temptations. So this ancient temple of Ranikival shows you a path, a spiritual path, to transform yourself into a divine being. You too can become a god, and you can be joyful and enlightened forever. If you visit this temple, you will find the secret key to unlock your spirituality and turn your dark, selfish desires into positive, selfless energy. In the West, this process of transformation was identified by Sigmund Freud, who is the father of psychoanalysis. He called it sublimation. To put it concisely, all the extraordinary positive achievements of people were once strange negative desires. The classic example was the case of Johann Friedrich Dieffenbach, who as a young boy would silently approach sleeping street dogs and cut their tails off. While this gave him a cruel, twisted pleasure, his family and neighbors were shocked at his brutal and inhuman desires. However, when he grew up, he turned into an extraordinary surgeon who unselfishly saved the lives of thousands of humans. He was able to transform his cruel pleasure of cutting innocent animals into the noble act of surgery. While Sigmund Freud claimed that we have to live with our dark desires and just manage it with sublimation, Indian philosophy takes it to another level. This process of sublimation, the process of converting your base selfish desires into positive energy, was already mentioned in ancient Indian texts as Kundalini. According to these texts, Kundalini is a latent energy found in everybody in the form of a twisted snake. If Kundalini is awakened properly, it can permanently eliminate your base desires and you can become joyful and be self-sufficient forever. This is why Indians have traditionally worshipped gods who were once humans. And even today, the popular culture of gurus is prevalent in India. This idea of becoming a god by using thoughts and emotions and meditation was formalized into a religion called Theosophy around 1875. According to its followers, the key to become god is held by every human, and the key lies within himself. All he has to do is to search within himself, find the key to unlock himself from the jail of thought, and he would live in eternal freedom and glory. And in Raniki Vav, the hidden carvings portray that specific key to unlock yourself. Look how he's holding a key in one hand while pointing the other hand to God. Nobody has observed these secret details until now. If you observe these men carefully, you will find out how to sublimate your base desires. Their hands and eyes reveal their dark desires and their spiritual awakening. These carvings show a step-by-step -step procedure for sublimating your negative energy into a positive vibration to transform yourself from a human to a divine being. I'm not going to explain this in detail, why some men are holding some objects, why some men are pointing both hands up, why some men are pointing one hand up, why some men have their eyes closed, and why some eyes are open. But if you visit this temple of Raniki Val and observe these carvings carefully, you'll find the key 
to unlock your true potential. I'm Praveen Mohan. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.